are about to start recording. Okay, uh, this is a presentation between uh, uh, Kent Jones, myself, and Steve Payton. Uh, it will be uh, for about an hour, and we're going to start with uh, Professor Jones. Okay, uh, the topic, by the way, is right there in front of you, pattern building, implementing fluency activities. Okay, Kent, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Jose. Um, so, my, hello everyone, my name is Kent Jones. I am a um, senior tenured lecturer at APU, uh, Ritz Macon Asia Pacific University in Beppu. And um, I'm presenting today with uh, Jose Cruz from Kyushu University and Stephen Payton from Fuku uh, Fukuoka University. And I think this is really sort of Jose's baby, actually. Um, I think I met Jose, he was, I'm the uh, program chair for uh, Jolt Oita and um, Jose came to one of our symposiums and he, he gave a presentation about what we're going to be talking about today about building fluency activities. And I was really amazed by it. I thought it was really great. Um, and just one of the things that I asked him and sort of wanted to get a little bit of uh, theoretical grounding in this, like just sort of try to figure out exactly where his whole idea, which he's going to be explaining to you after me, um, just where it all fits in theoretically. Um, so I'm gonna start off by just talking to you about some key theories that sort of um, support his uh, th uh, fluency activities. And um, it's basically, I'm gonna to talk to you about skill acquisition theory and, um, and how uh, implementing skill acquisition theory helps to improve student um, fluency and particularly in the kind of uh, practice that, um, that Jose, um, Jose's system, uh, which is called the structure and control uh, verbal classrooms, how it sort of, um, how this idea of skill acquisition theory really supports um, what Jose is doing with this. And um, some, some key concepts I'm going to go over are schema, goals, motivation, priming, automaticity, and skill. Some of these you probably are quite familiar with. Um, but there's a little tweak, um, a little bit of uh, nuance um, to these ideas when we think about them in terms of skill acquisition theory. And then I'm going to also talk a little bit about the importance of meaningful practice, which I think Jose's system really works um, to create sort of a, a chance for meaningful practice for students. So basically skill acquisition theory, you can sort of think about it as a kind of continuum. Um, it starts out with the, inter the initial representation of knowledge. Um, in our case, we're gonna be talking about kind of language drills, but we actually didn't, we were thinking that we didn't quite like the word drills, but <laughs> kind of um, controlled practice anyways. And um, through that controlled practice, it leads to initial changes in behavior. Um, basically that's the learning process, um, kind of interlanguage. And then after, through this process of practice, um, it eventually leads to fluent spontaneous production. So that's basically how this continuum, um, which Dijkheiser formulated in 2007, um, that's what this, this um, theory proposes. Um, some key concepts are, first of all, the schema. I'm sure everybody's familiar with activating schemata, a schema or schemata, which is just the student's prior knowledge. Um, in our case, um, as university teachers, um, we have students who have a, quite a lot of um, schema, quite a lot of prior knowledge of grammar, um, but not so much this um, ability to actually use it, to make use of it. Um, they also sometimes lack goals, so the projected outcome of what they want to, to, uh, to get out of their English classes. And then motivation, so willingness to develop that initial schemata into more complex forms, uh, which is sort of, Jose will sort of explain his system, which I think really does this very well. And then the 
concept of priming is that idea that pre prior exposure to forms being taught um, will um, not only improve the student's knowledge, um, but it will also develop through this continuum into more complex forms. And, uh, and then finally, I think the two key ones here is automaticity is, is that ability to access those forms with minimal effort. And that's what that's really the goal um, within this system or this methodology. And then in the end of develop real skill, like a real ability to do things, which in our case is the ability to speak and listen and take part in not only conversations, but also debates. Um, and finally, a, an important part, because I, I started out with this talking about drills and um, the reason why I was sort of stopped myself and said that's a bit of a misnomer is because drills, sometimes we have this idea of something very mechanical, but that's not um, what we are proposing here. We're talking about meaningful practice. So actually language use. So if practice is simply mechanical, um, it produces language-like behavior, but not the desired language behavior. So we're not really um, proposing for a, a mechanical practice, but real uh, language behaviors, teaching real language behaviors. And through doing this, this reduces um, both the reaction time and the error rate. And the reaction time is huge, I think, for Japanese students, because one of the biggest problems with Japanese is just that they take a very long time to process language. Um, Jap Japanese students, like coming out of high school, um, they did they have a have problems with reaction time. Um, so this system and trying to facilitate this kind of automaticity um, is hopefully will really help them. And I think Jose is going to uh, to go on. I'm going to put it over to Jose now, and um, he's going to explain this system um, in a little bit more concrete terms. Hey, thanks, Kent. Uh, yeah. Um... I really do thank Kent because for the very first time over the maybe 25 years that I've been developing this system, he has uh, allowed me to see where the theoretical grounding of what I do actually uh, lies. Uh, but uh, even before I spoke to him, I have been, as I said, I've been working on this for over you know a couple of decades, and I want to show you exactly what it is that we're talking about. Once I'm done, uh, Steve will talk about how he took it uh, in, into his own. Uh, uh, classroom and uh, the results from there. But now uh, let's talk a little Jose, bit. Before you, before you go on, I can't see you, Jose. Your, your video doesn't seem to be on. I oh, can't see me and Ken. Uh, there you go. I'm sorry about there that. Go. Okay, go. Right. okay there are we go. good? Thanks, Steve. Okay, so um, let's take a look at uh, what we're dealing with here. Um, whoops, jumped at that one. <laughs> All righty. Um, when you look at fluency, look at the whole idea of it, um, one of the first things you go is, well, what is it? And if you try to define it, you actually have a hard time. When I have longer, uh, for example, at the symposium, or uh, longer two-hour presentations at Fukuoka that I did for Steve, uh, I ask people, get into groups and define fluency. What is it? How would you tell your students what it is? We want them all to be fluent, but then again, um, how do you tell them, well, you know you're fluent when you're this. Now, even if you look at the Sefer, the Sefer uh, definitions in the Wikipedia, they have a definition that is based on can do, can do this, can do that. But th it, there is no easy way to say to a student, do this until you get to there. Because that's what we tell, let's say, sports players. Hey, you know, you're a fast runner. If you can run uh, the 100 meters in 11 seconds or better, you're world class. If you can run it in 13 seconds or better, you're a pretty fast runner. There's no such thing for actually speaking. You can see that there's um, a degree of fluency. Uh, you can express ideas fluently, or you're very fluent. But what I propose is that we actually tell students something very, very simple that they can take away easily. You are fluent when you can speak about 110 to 120 words per minute, which is the equivalent of about two words per second. Two words per second sounds a little bit 
like this. And you know, maybe some children can speak this way. I've clocked myself and I actually speak at about maybe when I'm normally speaking 160, 165 words per minute. I'm on the fast side. But if you can get into this range of 130, 180, you're at native level fluency. Now, of course, there's slower speakers, there's faster speakers. When I'm under pressure, I can go even faster, 220, 230 words per, mi per minute. I've clocked myself to go faster. And this is easy to understand. If you tell students, okay, go home, use your phone, record your voice, now count the number of words in it, they know how much further they have to go. And then you can tell them, these are the exercises you need to go forward. The concept of a mean length run addresses the idea that you can't just speak words that have no meaning, uh, words that are just a bunch of staccato bursts of non-information. You want to actually be able to take meaningful words and say them within, uh, within the same sentence, okay, without breaking it up with you knows, I mean, um, uh, so these, these, this, these disfluent words shouldn't come in uh, for any more than about eight words that makes a student kind of start to approach fluency. If you're a native speaker and you practice a speech, you can go on for 30, 40, 50 words, uh, maybe 60 words without having to say an um or an uh. uh. And that is your native level fluency. But when was the last time you had a student come to you and say, Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this week or next week? 11 words. And when was the last time a student actually said those words to you in that string? They, they usually can't if they're around, you know, the, the fluency levels that we have in Japanese universities. So the takeaway here is that you want them to target your speed, not just in your speaking, but in your responses and your idea creation, as Kent was saying. And that smoothness is part of the package. You can't just speak too quickly without actually being able to have some control of your voice. We know that we also have trouble teaching students about uh, the melody that English has. And that's something that we want to get through to them. So how do we do this? Well, what I came up with is this idea called structure control and verbal classrooms. And I do want to give a shout out to the people who developed this before me. And then I stood on their shoulders to create this. This used to be an intensive course for freshman salarymen. Uh, it was developed in 1994, but I took it into a university classroom and had to adjust a lot of things because it was supposed to be an intensive course. And Structure control is the idea, like um, Kent was saying, that we take these, these sentences and we scaffold them just little by little by little until the students start to feel that this is something that has become automatized, internalized, all kinds of words to it. You can say uh, it becomes a reflexive action. You don't have to think about it. Um, and using that very, very slowly, that's structure control. Verbal classrooms, are you, as you're going to see in a couple of videos that I'm going to show you, is the idea that you can do this without boring the kids. You can do this without having them leave the classroom and say, oh man, that was just a bunch of patterns and drills. You can make it so it's fun. You can make it so you can give them what it is that they've actually secretly been wanting. So before we go uh, into that, uh, there are some disadvantages and advantages for the students. One of the biggest disadvantages is these kids who have been trained by their high school teachers and maybe some of their other university teachers that, oh, you got to get a good TOEIC score. You don't get a good TOEIC score. You're not going to get a, You're not going to get a good job. So they get a little bit confused. Hey, this has nothing to do with TOEIC. But once they do a lot of these practices, they understand that the advantages are there and that eventually this gives them actual speaking skill. And that is what raises your TOEIC score permanently, not just something that you study for three months or so. The instructors themselves also have advantages and disadvantages to this system. Uh, and, but I got to tell you, the advantages so heavily outweigh whatever disadvantages you might want to read in the few more seconds that this slide is up there. Mostly that it is less work for you. After you've been trained and after you get past the hump of like the nervousness of not having a, a workbook or a textbook to work from, there is no paper test. You do not have to try to review a, a textbook. It's more rewarding because you spend more time actually watching the kids as opposed to watching your notes. And this is something that I don't stress enough. This is a method that is viable for for, for, for instructors who might not necessarily be North American or Oceanian or, or Commonwealth. If you're a Filipino, if you're a, a, a Japanese person who has a degree of fluency and you've always thought, well, I wanna teach speaking, but the kids, uh, I don't want them to pick up my accent. 
That is so not important, and this method will prove it to you. It is a viable method for non-native but fluent instructors. Okay, so just a takeaway. You are maximizing student speed and output quantity. You are setting student focus on fluency, right? You, you don't want to uh, think about complexity. You want to get the fluency so that then the complexity teaching matters. This is basically what I was taught when I was a kid. When I went to Canada, when my family immigrated to Canada, I could not speak English. And I had to take a special second language class uh, in uh, what would that be, uh, third grade elementary school. And I still remember this because in Canada, we also have French as a second language and we take a lot of tips from how French actually uh, teachers teach their language. So this is a basic conjugation for the B verb with the seven basic pronouns. And we repeated this in class. I took this and I started moving it around a bit, playing with it, and I came up with something that I want to show you in this video. So let, this video will play for a couple of minutes. Let's, uh, let's take a watch on this. My teacher wrote this up for me. Oh gosh, no, what is that? That's uh, 46 years ago? Holy cow. Okay, uh, when I first went to Canada and, and one day she said, Jose, stand up, say all of this in a big, loud, fast voice. And I would stand up and I would say, I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Very good, two times, faster, louder. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. <laughs> now, I bet if I asked one of you right now to do that, you couldn't. And you are university students who've studied English for six years. Just goes to show you, all the studying you do doesn't get you ready for speaking. So we're gonna speak today. First thing we're gonna do, I want you to turn around in your chairs 90 degrees, turn around 90 degrees, turn around and face your partner on that side. Just, no, turn around in your chair, yeah, just turn around in your chair. You don't have to turn the chair, just turn around in your chair. Good, okay, there you go, good. Okay, and this is what we're gonna do. I'm going to show you how to do this with you. Take it from the first line, somebody, when I say, ready, go, first line, okay, you will, I, I'll go with I am, you'll begin with you are, and I'll continue with he is, she is, and we'll continue from there. When we get to the bottom, we go back to the top. Ready? I'll start. I am. Uh, you are. He is. She is. It is. Look at me. Look they at me. are. They are. I am. You are. She is. is. We are. are. I am. You he are. is. She it is. We are. Over here, over here, over here. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah? Yes. But it looks so easy, yeah? Because yeah. looking at something in English, studying it on paper is nowhere near as difficult as looking at somebody in the eyes. So it's okay. If you want to look at this, go ahead. Take a look. You can check the order. You can check whatever it is you want. But when you speak to a person, Learn to go from paper to a person's eyes. Look all you want, but when your mouth moves, you go back to the person. Okay, when I say ready, go, somebody begins. Look at your partners. Ready, go. That demonstration class was filmed with the permission of the students. They signed model releases, so don't worry, I'm not violating anybody's privacy. However, they had no idea what I was going to teach them. I was doing research work with the other professor that's in the room that's moving the cameras around. And we wanted to film the actual reactions of these students as they were given uh, these SCVC exercises. There are uh, actually, there are two students who have done it before, but of the 20, there were only two. And the, the, the kid that I just demonstrated with, he had no idea what was going on, but he still managed. And I also want you to notice that as soon as I said go, they went, they started to speak. When was the last time that happened in your classroom? When was the last time you said, okay, everybody speak? And it still sounds like that in the classroom, right? Well, this works every time. Um, I want to show you now, uh, basically the, the same exercises, but, um, now, after I go through that, I am, you are, he is, she is, I tag a, an adjective on there. I am sleepy, you are sleepy, he is sleepy, she is sleepy. Let's make that a little bit more difficult. We just, uh, let's do a couple switches that. Let's make that a little bit more difficult. Hey, how about the negative? Uh, I, 
Oops, sorry, that should be, I, uh, I am not hungry. Sorry, it says have. I am not hungry. Uh, you are not hungry. He is not hungry. Very, uh, big mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe uh, you were in Osaka. I was in Osaka. You were in Osaka. He was in Osaka. She was in Osaka. You think the basic statements, get them used to the seat switching, uh, get them used to the fact that they've got to look at people they've never met. Very first time you're speaking to this person and you're speaking to them in a foreign language, kind of a freaky feeling for some of these kids. Uh, tag on a secondary object. Hey, maybe tag on a tertiary object. Now you're starting to approach the problem with mean length runs. The idea that you want to say, I was in Osaka last week for job hunting. That is actually nine words. And for a lot of these kids, it is hard to say that all the way through. But because you're putting speed pressure on them, they're actually fumbling and finding out, because everybody's different, what words are difficult. For some kids, it's the L. For some kids, it's the J. And then we take it to the next level. After we do all of the statements, we take it to the next level, but still using the same scaffold that I had before. Because what you don't want to do is give these kids a challenge where they know inside that I have a higher degree of failing than I have of succeeding. If they always feel like, hey, you know what? That's different, but I'm pretty sure I can do that because we did something very similar just seconds ago, they will continue. If you jump that scaffold too high, which sometimes happens with people who are not used to this, it does make the kids kind of freak out a little bit. So uh, let's take a look at this. This now includes the question because the, 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 the English question form of subject verb switched to verb subject you think about it, it's very easy to understand, very easy to explain, but to do reflexively, to get that automaticity that leads to skill, watch this, okay? I have a very crazy way of doing this practice. Person starts at I go. When you make the question, you make it with the subject next in order. So if your answer was I go, your question will use you. I go, do you go? Your answer to this question uses the same subject, which then takes the next subject. This question uses this answer, which then takes the next subject, and so on and so on. It looks hard, but actually, once you start doing it, it starts getting pretty easy. Well, let's take this slowly. Do you have any questions, dear? No. Okay, so I'll go slowly. I go, do you go? Hmm? I go, do you go? Uh, you go, does he go? Good. He goes, does she go? She goes, do we go? Hmm. Next one after she. Uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? We go, do they go? They go, do I go? I, you go. Hmm? Um, they go, do I go? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? Very good. Do your best. Ready? Go! You go this way. <laughs> okay? Okay. If you need to look, you can look. But when you speak, you speak to my eyes. Ready? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? She goes, does it, uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? Uh, we go, da, do they go? Good. Do your best. Ready? Go! I go, do you go? You go, does he go? I want to repeat again uh, that these kids were not told what they would be encountering. You are seeing a very natural reaction. I also want to uh, point out that little uh, white line uh, to the left-hand side. These are relatively high-level kids. And actually, if you speak to them individually, you'll get the impression, oh, these kids have good English. And they do. 
What they cannot do is speak quickly. They stutter. They cannot say any more than maybe four or five words at a time. Their responses are slow. Uh, their question formation always defaults to, instead of saying something like, where will you go tomorrow? They'll say something like, tomorrow, Mr. Cruz, where go? Which is fine in terms of communication, but you want to get to the next level. They have to be able to control where will you go tomorrow? Level 650, you give them a piece of paper, then you'll probably be convinced that they're fine. But when it comes to speaking, we all know that's a different skill. Um, so let's go do the, the next thing. Oh, I also wanted you to see, Steve, maybe you can unmute. Uh, I also wanted you to see that um, that is what I call verbal cl classrooms, where I, I get them to switch seats. They always have a different partner. Uh, there's a, an, uh, an important thing. There's a huge din in the room. They cannot hear each other's mistakes. They can barely hear the other person's voice, their pair partner's voice, and they usually can really only hear their own voice. But because they can hear their own voice within this din, that is what really reinforces the fact that they're speaking English in a difficult situation. So normally I have an entire room of teachers doing this because you just don't know what this is like until you do it yourself. But because we're in a limited time frame here, I'm just going to do this with Steve. Now, yes, Steve has done this before. And yes, Steve is fluent in English. But let's give this a try. OK, Steve, um, I just want to get to that next slide. So I am, are you, you are, is he. Ready? I'll start. I am, are you? You are, is he? He is, is she? She is, is it? It is, are we? We are, are they? They are, am I? I am, are you? Good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you just have no idea how hard that is to master until you actually do it. Steve will testify to that. Absolutely, it doesn't have yeah, anything, we just look at it. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact you're a native speaker or not. But it is important for you to master this because these are the basic drills that your students need. You can take this to, um, to the next verb. And that's only two verbs out of what? I think 25,000. Uh, English verbs, do, I do, do you, because this do is the center of all regular verb question construction. As you saw before, I said, I go, do you go? If they can't master this, especially that third person with the S sound in the, in the present tense, that remains as a problem for them for a long time. Um, they, can't just, they can't just get to the next level. Uh, you take it to the regular verbs with have, as, uh, as uh, I was showing with go before. Uh, then you start extending this out, as I said, with secondary and tertiary uh, uh, objects. Now, in this case, what I did was throw in what I call a double variable conjugation. And double variable means that instead of just thinking about the subject uh, to match the verb, you actually also have to talk about the possessive. Steve, you want to give this a try? Yep. Here we go. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? You have Netflix on your phone. Does he have Netflix on his phone? He has Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? She has Netflix on her phone. Does it have Netflix on its phone? Good. Okay. I, I know I threw him a curveball. That's why it was hard. But again, if you don't practice for this, uh, here's another example. My grandfather plays tennis with me. So once you think of a specific sentence or a specific structure that you want to try, uh, SCVC can actually wrap itself around that and get these kids to practice it. Because one of the things that I think, you know, when I was learning French that was hard for me is that the teacher would say, okay, Jose, now let's practice this. Uh, but I was asked to perform before I could practice. This is the practice and they are not asked to perform, but to themselves because they got to do this with uh, their friends. Uh, they know that this is something important. Now, I want to get to just one last thing here uh, called um, the mean length run with a concept called one idea, one breath. Let's take a quick look at this video. A little bit difficult. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with or sister, I, my, you, your, don't forget, so let's review, I, my, you, your, he, his, his she, her, it, it's, it's, now, especially that S, 
If that S is not there, it changes the meaning. We, oh. our, they, they. there. Okay. <laughs> I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You live in Kitakyushu with your sister. With your sister. Does he live in Kitakyushu with his sister? Good. Very good. But again, we come back to this practice. <laughs> perfect grammar. Pronunciation was perfect, but that was not fluent. So, agree with going? Go back to this. He lives in Kitakyushu with his sister. If you feel confident, do everything in one breath. But try to do at least one sentence with no stopping, with a nice pace, all in one breath. Do your best. Ready? Go! I live in Kitakyushu with my friend. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your friend? Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You were going up and down and up and down. So smooth, smooth. Okay. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with my sister? 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 Do you live in one thing that I, I also want to point out to you, they are eager for your correction. They are not embarrassed when you go to them. They, did you see those two boys lean in to listen to me? Because they knew that what I was telling them was, oh, you got your grammar wrong, you're going to lose points. I was telling them how to perform the skill better. It's a mindset that is much more similar to becoming a sports coach than becoming an instructor. Uh, other examples, you can just go nuts with this. I like watching Blu-rays at home more than going to the cinema. How about you? Uh, now, the, uh, the switch. This is where we start moving towards independent conversations, where they start using their idea creation skills. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because, yeah, I knew I'd be a little bit pressed for time. You tell these kids that you take a very simple sentence like, I like music, and I like music, and I like music, and you just keep repeating it until you can find a new word to slip into the object space. When you get that, then you repeat that a couple times. Then you ask the question. The partner takes the object that was just revealed in the new sentence and, again, used in the question, and becomes, that becomes the repeat word. Then the, the challenge becomes not these long sentences, but to come up with words while you're speaking. Steve, you want to open up your mic a bit for this one? Sure. Yep. OK, I'll start, OK? I like music. I like music. I like music. I like music. I like baseball. I like baseball. I like baseball. Do you like baseball? I like baseball. I like baseball. I like baseball. I like barbecues. I like barbecues. I like barbecues. Do you like barbecues? I like barbecues. I like barbecues. I like barbecues. I like Fukuoka. I like Fukuoka. I like Fukuoka. Do you like Fukuoka? I like Fukuoka. I like Fukuoka. I like Fukuoka. I like Anpan Man. I like Anpan Man. Do you like Anpan Man? And it'll it'll go some cues happening right here. Yeah, yeah. It'll 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 go nuts. The kids are having fun. They're saying the names of their favorite K-pop idols, and um, and then oh, you like them too. I like them too. And you get this organic reaction with them because you are not reading from a piece of paper. You are not being forced to just repeat somebody else's English. So that is a uh, an example of sentences that you can use, and I call that the switch. That takes you only to about week seven. And as I said, this is a 64 week curriculum. There is so much more here that I wish I could show you. Um, but uh, just to show you my diagrams, it starts going more and more with more uh, 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 interesting structures that where I allow them to start making their own choices about what can be done. And eventually uh, it starts that, that apex of a complicated chart uh, becomes smaller and smaller. Here's the apex of the chart. And at one point, I just tell them, okay, today we're going to talk about high school. Everybody ready? Go. Independent conversation. All you have to do is just name the topic. They go. I know you might not believe me, but I have video evidence. <laughs> um, and here it is. This is a class, and this is a slightly lower class, 510. Took them from uh, basically zero. They didn't know anything about my method. This is week 13, just before the test. And I have blanked out their faces, but you can hear the din in the class. <laughs> Okay. 
They are animated, they are gesturing, they are raising their voices, they are saying their own opinions. I did not tell them what to say. I taught them how to say it. I gave them targets, they ran with the targets and eventually here just before the test, um, if they did not do well, there's little things like nervousness or uh, maybe coordination with their group, uh, but it wasn't because, um, it, it never almost is their lack of skill. They know English, they just don't know how to say it fast. The takeaways, fluency first, then you worry about complexity, quantity before accuracy. Skill is not, I'm sorry, fluency is, is a skill. It is not a fact set, okay? And you are a coach, not a lecturer. Stop lecturing, start helping them improve their skills. You target the quantity, not the quality. You show them what to do. You don't tell them what to do. You show them and you, and you try to be empathic about it, okay? You're very, very careful about atomizing these class progress steps. But this is something that I can't put into this uh, presentation, but I can help you with if you contact me because if you're interested, I'm interested in helping you. These are testimonials from other teachers who have tried this. And Steve is gonna give his own uh, uh, live testimonials here. But uh, every teacher I know that, have that has tried this says, wow, to encapsulate. They, uh, they say, it rocks. My students love it. Students don't want to stop. It is a game changer. The one at the top, uh, Mary Virgil Uchida, she teaches little kids. The one in the middle, Jenny Crittenden, students don't want to stop. She teaches as an ALT in a high school. Catherine Akasaka, she teaches in a junior high school. This hits all levels. This is a link to my YouTube playlist of this entire video set, two hours of it. Um, you can contact me later. I'll give you my contact information right now. I want to give the uh, floor over to, pardon me, to Steve Payton. And he's going to talk about his experience with this. Uh, Steve, go ahead, buddy. Cool. All righty. Thanks, Jose. Um, yeah, I'm Steve Payton. I'm uh, in Fukuoka here with, with the other guys here. I'm in, well, you're a Kitakushu of Kenso in Oita. Um, my background in this is that I went along to uh, Jose's presentation at Oita Jal. Um, when was that? End of 2018, it must have been, um, and saw what Jose was doing and was intrigued enough that um, I invited him. I was in a position within Fukuoka Jal to invite him to come and present for us just a couple of months later, and he did. And so I got the, the, the longer, the two hour version. And um, now it's it's here i'm presenting alongside you jose it's a bit of a thrill actually i tell you because i've seen your patient twice and and it was interested me so much and here i am on the stage with you that's kind of cool all right so now i'm going to talk about how i um <laughs> i kind of differ and and the ways in which i sort of diverge a little bit away from what jose's done but keeping the theme right so what jose you just sort of let slip there this is up to week seven and this is a 64 week curriculum um that's great but it needn't be you know so set as a path that you follow exactly what Jose has done or anything like that. And, and I'm here to kind of um, represent that, that um, adaptability of this approach. Um, so I kind of like to think that I kind of commandeered what Jose has created and, and, and I've pinched all the good ideas from him as well. Um, what I saw in it when I was, uh, let me bring that up. Are you seeing that keynote now, Jose? You seeing that share screen? Yes, okay, cool. So I've got my own textbook that I've made and, um, and an approach to grammar that I've, that I've uh, run for a couple of years now. And so what I saw in Jose's approach was a, was a chance to, um, to adapt his thing to my thing. Uh, my approach to grammar is, uh, you've seen, I call it control words. It's basically um, auxiliary verbs and modals but I kind of view them as that real hub of the language. And if you can find that in each sentence then you can really control in as much as you can make a negative, you can make a yes, no question, you can make a Gimonchi question, right? The sky is yellow, the sky isn't yellow. Is the sky yellow? No, the sky is blue. Or what color is the sky? So it's always hinging around that, that one word, right? Now, in my book, I've got example sentences as I introduce this sort of concept and just very short things. And I get the students to find these control words. and uh, they they were at home. The teacher is speaking too fast. This is easy to understand. So I demonstrate that, look, it's so easy just to turn these all off. They were not at home. The teacher is not speaking too fast. This is not easy to understand, whatever that would be. But just to, to well, drill, to, to, to drill into them that this is not complicated, right? If you can find that word, and it does get more complicated later when we're dealing with do, does, did, and, and things that become combinations rather than standalone um, 
visible auxil uh, auxiliaries. But um, never mind that, because what I started quite early was trying to drill this because finding this word uh, avails itself. Is that the right word? It, it, it allows you to demonstrate patterns that exist in English. And when you can find patterns and you, you, you just blown it wide, or wide open, right? That you're not memorizing anymore because these students have learned to memorize. But when you can facilitate pattern recognition and pattern utilization, then I think you, you're really helping them out. So I, in the early days, I came up with a, with a drill basically around this so I would try to get and it didn't really work so well but I would say here's a, a center she has traveled in Egypt so I would get them in pairs and student A would say she, student A would turn it into a yes no question just by changing the order has she has she traveled in Egypt her part the partner would answer with a negative so they're already sort of conjugating this thing she hasn't traveled in, in Egypt and then a new sentence she has traveled in Australia and then they would switch and they go to the next sentence down that page that I just showed you. And the next sentence might happen to be, uh, John can play the guitar. Oops, here we are, John can play this. Can, John can't play, can John play? So answer yes, ask, ask yes, no question. Can John play the guitar? Uh, John can't play the guitar, he can play the piano, right? Something like this. So this sort of idea of drilling. Um, so what I saw with, uh, with Jose's approach, I, I like the idea of drilling and I wanted them to do more and more and more of it just to, to clear out all the confusion and just get ahead and do it. But, you know, drilling is not regarded particularly as communicative. So when I saw what Jose was doing and the students are so into it and they're just doing it and they're processing it, I went, right, I can really, I can really uh, uh, take advantage of this. Um, I saw an opportunity, right? So look, what I the, the situation I was in though was that I didn't want to abandon my book and I didn't want to abandon my grammar approach and I didn't want to you know take on a, a long curriculum and, and replace everything I was doing, so I um I viewed that I would start using it as warm ups and I did start with the I am you are he is she is it is I am are you you are is he he is is she, but I thought I would be doing a fifteen or twenty minute warm up but often it would become 40, 45 minutes right because the students were so into it. And there are so many places you can take it and, and have fun with it. Steve, I've, like, got, yes. a, I've got a yes. black screen on your share. Well, that's fine. No, that's correct. Okay. I'm getting to the next one in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I should have bounced out of the share screen. But uh, yeah, um, what I, I'm getting to that. Actually, I will. Sorry. Sorry, I should have done that. I didn't think I would talk quite as long there. But um, what I was saying was uh, I thought it would be a warm up. Uh, it ended up being much longer. And the analogy that I would draw and with the students also is, is this, that if you have a tangled up bunch of headphone cables, right? It's that thing of when you can sort of untangle it and you've got to fiddle it out and you've got to figure where this bit goes and that bit goes. And eventually you kind of get to the point, I don't know if I will, oh, I did where it's you know, a straight wire. And this is the, what I saw happening with my students' you know, performance of English. It's like they're figuring it out. They're cogniting on does and do and word order and switching word and is he and he is and is she and, and all the conjugations, right? So that was going very well. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, it appeared to be going very well, but I wanted to confirm. So I'll go back to my, uh, my black screen here and turn it into this. I ran, uh, a survey and it's one of those things where I didn't do it for the sake of a research project I did it for the sake of like actually truly wanted to know what the students were thinking um, so an anonymous survey on Google Docs on Google Forms rather and uh, on their phones and, and and I asked about 159 students um, just a, a very short I think it was only four I've got four slides to show you and I think that's all I asked so do you agree I enjoy doing these drills like honestly oops and here's this here's a result I mean, we're close to 90%. We're around the 90% answering positively, either strongly agreeing or agreeing that I enjoy. That's unheard of, 90%. I couldn't believe it. Um, the next question asked, I th do you agree with this? I think these drills are useful practice for speaking English better, which I think it is, but do, is there some disconnect between me and the students? Are, are they not seeing what I'm seeing? But turns out they're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. Again, yellow and green here for agree, where again in the 90% region that they think they are useful. Next one, uh, I think these drills are useful practice for understanding English grammar, right? So that's a more a sort of receptive thing. And it's a more of the, you know, when we're understanding, that's more what they're in, in, inclined to be doing in classrooms is listening and sort of 
you know, getting knowledge. Um, so to supply there as well, because that might be something that's kind of more meaningful to them because that's all they've ever done perhaps. And again, yes, <laughs> right? Green and yellow here showing, you know, around the 90% mark again, consistently, right? Again and again. Um, and the final one, as I said, I was doing between sometimes upwards of 30, 40 minutes each lesson with this unintentionally, I wanted to do it a little bit shorter. So I just wanted to ask them, should we do more of this or, or less? All right? Should we be doing more or fewer you know, in terms of, of, uh, of, of numbers? Because I would, I would go through maybe five or six sentences. Do you want to do more? Do you want to do less? Um, turns out they're pretty happy with the bout, let's keep doing the same, uh, which is a, a good sort of middle of the road answer, which I was happy with. Um, so there's that. I mean, and, and I, I just sort of casually did that on, on a whim one, one week and, and sent Jose the, the results and he was as staggered you know, as, as much as, as I was, which sort of surprised me, Jose, because I know you've been seeing the success of this. But in a, in a secret, in a, an anonymous sort of survey, they, they answered very similarly. So um, one more thing I wanted to, to quickly go through, and I'll only, I'll only take another minute, is that I'm doing it to some extent nowadays in this... Uh, crazy distance situation and man, seeing those videos of students making a whole bunch of noise in class. Oh, oh yeah. it sort of broke my heart. It's like, oh, geez, I want to get back to that. But in Zoom, I'm doing a similar thing. I, I, I draw up these things on my iPad and uh, iPad's basically my uh, you know, digital whiteboard. So the same thing, I, I, in, a, in a Zoom room like this, like Jose and I just basically did. I have, you have, he has, she has, it has. Drill that for a couple of times. I uh, go to another one like this where I can draw up instead of a, a whiteboard or a chalkboard, we, you, it is possible to do you know, this sort of thing on, a, on an iPad. I have, have you? And as students are doing this, I often do it with groups of three. So I'll sort of prompt them, you know, I'll say, here, you're going to you and you, or you know, has he, and then you've got a he, so you're going back to he, and I can sort of prompt them along as we go along here. Um, a bit of preparation, but it saves a bunch of time in the, in the lesson and getting into sentences. You know, have, uh, have you been, uh, I, I have been overseas. Have you been overseas? Yes, you have been overseas. Oh yes, you have, or we can go to a sentence. Yes, you have been overseas, has he? So anyway, what I'm saying here it is adaptable and it is, as useful in a distance learning situation as just about everything is, which has its obvious flaws and, uh, and shortcomings. But um, yeah, I can't recommend this highly enough. I wish I could get back in the classroom and get students facing each other and doing this. Um, this was to be my year of really actually amending my textbook quite dramatically at the beginning of the year to accommodate this. I was, I was planning on doing 30, 40 minutes every week of this and then, cutting down on my other materials, but uh, just in the nick of time, that sort of didn't happen. And then we, uh, I, I kept all my materials in because I would need it for, uh, for, uh, for the distance classes. But um, certainly in future years, I want to be doing much, much more of this. It's really fantastic. I can't speak highly enough about it. And I'll probably hand over back to you, Jose, at that point. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I want to just uh, display my last slide here so that then if you do want to get in touch with me, if you do want to get in touch with Steve and Kent, I'm sure he, he uh, probably would be willing to speak with you a bit. Uh, here are our contact points. And um, I will be here for the next 10 minutes at least uh, to take any questions and we're gonna open up those questions. But before we do, what I would like is I'm going to uh, stop the share for just a moment. I would like everyone actually uh, to open up your microphones you do not have to applaud for me, but I would like you to applaud uh, for my two, uh, my two friends because uh, they're great in helping me understand that this actually isn't just a narcissistic tendency of mine to think that this is a good system. Uh, this actually does go out to more than just my students. And I hope this goes out to you guys too and you start telling other people. I really do think, again, a narcissistic tendency of mine that I have something good here. So let's uh, applaud for uh, Steve and Ken. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, if you would like to uh, throw out your questions on open mic or if you raise your hand in the participants list, uh, Steve and I will uh, uh, take a look at, for those hands and for those questions and we'll try to answer them in the remaining time that we have. Uh, go ahead, everyone. Anyone have a question? I can ask a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, sorry, I can't read your kanji. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, I forgot to change no, it's my okay. Go ahead. Uh, 
Maybe the last is ko. Yeah. <laughs> Wakato. Yeah, right. you know, uh, just uh, level five kanji. <laughs> Wakato, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I, I I learned that your students were quite uh, high level in 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 the English proficiency, and then uh, I wonder if you have ever had any comments like um, when they when they first started that I am um, sorry I am you are she is he is la la la. Um, whether they at some point felt it's like a little bit like low in level. And I asked this question because I, I've been interested in improving students speaking and writing fluency. And then I somehow managed to uh, help students improve their fluency in communication courses. But because there's uh, mixed level students from like TOEIC, 650 to uh, down to maybe 280 or something. Uh, whoever with TOEIC 650 usually comment like, uh, this, uh, this is really fun, but the level is really low, which I totally disagree. But anyways, have you ever had that sort of comment? I will have that quizzical look on faces when I first write up, I am, you are, he or she is. And that quizzical look will stay on their faces even while I'm telling the story, this is how I learned language. And, and I think it's, it's really good that I can actually say, I'm, I, I will swear on whatever you want, uh, whatever holy book you, you believe in, that I am not lying, this is how I learned how to speak languages. So they go, okay, well, let's listen a little bit. And if you just follow me for a little bit, you're, gonna, you're not going to understand it, you're going to feel it that you as a 650, you as a 280 are at the same level in terms of your fluency skills. You might have different knowledge sets, but that doesn't mean you have the same fluency skills. And once they start going, yeah, you know, generally the 400s to 600s, they'll go a little faster. The 200s might be stumbling a little bit more. But when we get to something like, I'm not hungry, are you hungry? You're not hungry, is he hungry? Everybody levels off. And they get that uh, from the start of I am, you are, he is. Then they started with I do, I have, I have some money. Uh, I don't have any money. They start going, wow, this is harder than I thought. Mm -hmm. So it might be, yeah, maybe they'll go, mm, yeah, this looks a little too easy. But then they do it and they go, wow, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But by the time they get into the exercises, they're, uh, they're convinced, I think. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, Jennifer, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, has this ever been tried for Japanese learning, not just English learning, as far as you know? I will let Steve Payton answer that question. <laughs> I have a project that I was beginning in um, January, and then the whole world blew up, and I couldn't really go very much further with it. But um, yeah, I, I, I've been wanting to drill Japanese verb conjugations. I came in 2008 began learning 2008 and I just never mastered the conjugations of, you know, it's got, oh, it's got one eye, kaku, ka kan eye, all those things. I just never nailed, right? Um, over the years, I've been trying to come up with drills using Excel sp uh, like spreadsheet um, lookup tables and things to randomize things because I like to random. Um, long story short, thanks for the plug, Jose. Um, JapaneseLanguageDrills.com. Yeah. Japanese language drills .com is a is a wow. project that I've started. It's been very much put on hold this year. Oh, I, a bit but uh, but do have a look at uh, Japanese language drills .com and, and contact me because I want to know if anyone ever uses it. Me on the <laughs> list. But, uh, Cheers, thank you. I get, I get the impression that people were more impressed by that than they were about my system, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no. uh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just jealous because, like you know, Steve worked on something great, and I can vouch for it. So please go visit. Well, it's, it, it, I haven't worked on. I've begun. I've just done the first few steps, but it's. I, I, just, I just when I when I got it working because it depends on Quizlet. Quizlet to randomize sort of flashcards and speak. And speak. I walk down the street literally with, with, with my phone, you know, in my pocket, and I'm thumbing through cards, listening on audio, and drilling Japanese, and it's unreal. So sorry, I'm trying to not steal the thunder of, of Jose Singh, but it's based on drilling, right? Drilling has this bad rap, and it should not. And it's and it works, and it just that whole thing of untangling. My mind is untangling confusions I've had with Japanese for for a long, long time, and that comes back to again, of course what Jose is saying about our students with English. They've got all this knowledge, but in terms of getting it from here out, it just gets all tangled, right? So when they when they 
given the challenge and the achievable challenge of untangling it in their mind of word order and conjugation of I am, you are, he is to begin with. And then I have some money. Do you have any money? Some, any, and all the plurals and the, and the double variable conjugations, as you mentioned, I, I live somewhere with my, do you live somewhere with your, they know all that. They've known that since first year, junior high school, yep. when they, when they, Go to say when it, it comes to speaking it. Yeah, they're at this, they're at that. Um, and I think it also um, uh, uh, stresses the fact that structure control in verbal classrooms does not have the word English in that acronym. This is applicable to all, almost all mm -hmm. uh, uh, Latin and Western languages. And it's hard to actually apply it to Japanese because it's a different grammar set. But the concept of actually scaffolding in atomized steps, using the classroom energy to get these kids to do something from from where I say again, the no fail scenario, uh, a concerned teacher with maybe some guidance or maybe none, if uh, I didn't actually get a lot of guidance to actually develop this, it was just instinct. In my own experience, I, I, I had to learn uh, English, I had to learn French, and I had to learn Japanese. And now I have been, uh, of course, I'm fluent in English, I was fluent in French, and now I'm pretty sure I'm fluent in Japanese, all because I took this to my own learning. Um, any more questions? We have maybe time for one more. Yes, no, uh, okay. Oh, hang on, Jennifer. Was somebody else, because you already had a question, was somebody else trying to get in there? Michiko. Good. Yeah. Michiko san. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Does the practice have to be done by all the students at the same time, at the sa in the same manner? Or, for example, the student writes some sentences, their own original sentences, and each student practice that um, in fluency level. Uh, does it lose some um, uh, like effectiveness in your way? I think if the student are thinking, oh, this practice is kind of law level English, then why don't we use the student their own sentences to pronounce fluently? How about this idea? I would say that in terms of maintaining the, ver the verbal classroom's atmosphere, mm. that these kids are taught the idea that you learned how to speak Japanese mm. without ever knowing how to grip a pen. You learned how to speak Japanese without ever knowing how to write any of your kana. Mm. You learn to speak it by speaking. Mm. And yes, there are some students who probably think, oh, well, I wanna write it down. I tell them not to. First, you have to be able to show me that you can say these things. Also, too, if you have a class of, let's say, 20 students and 10 of them are writing something down and only 10 are speaking, you're approaching a level of noise in the classroom where you can differentiate voices. And once you're able to differentiate voices, that's when students start going, uh, people can hear me. When you get to about 15, 16 students, no one can hear anyone else's voices. That's why this class is great for the Japanese situation where we're forced to teach 40 students at a time. These students cannot hear each other and they know they cannot hear each other. But you're gonna need pretty motivated students if you get down to about eight or 10 because they know that they can hear each other's voices. But it still has happened, I've worked with it, but I want to get these kids away from the idea that I need pen and paper to learn. I need a textbook to learn. I need a dictionary to learn. No, you don't, you need this. What I meant was everybody write um, in the right, like the time when they are supposed to write and everybody finish writing, then everybody start to uh, speak or um, practice fluency. So not somebody's writing, somebody else is saying not, not. I would still, um, maybe it's my own prejudice for the way that I run things. I would still think that one of the other targets that I have is the idea that within your 90 minutes, you're trying to maximize person speaking hours. Mm. You, you, you have classes where they're writing all the time. You have classes where they're reading all the time. You have classes, these kids sometimes have five or six classes at university where they're doing all of the passive quiet skills. And this class, my class might be the one class where they're actually speaking and I want to take advantage of that. Wow. So, you know, they have writing classes, go right in there. Here, we're gonna speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, I'm sort of approaching time. I actually have to go host a different one, but um, Steve and Kent are willing to uh, sit with you if you'd like in the Hangouts room. Uh, 
Can I just get a sort of a quick raise hands if anybody wants to go to the Hangouts with Steve and Kent so they know how many people they would. Okay, we got at least Jennifer. Steve and Kent will go out to the Hangouts room. Uh, if you don't know where that is, go back, uh, thank you. Uh, go back to Eventzilla, uh, look for the Hangouts label, go there and Kent and Steve will uh, try to answer your questions. If there's other people there, they'll go to a breakout room with you. I would love to go, but unfortunately I'm very busy hosting uh, rooms for this conference. However, Jose. Uh, yes, sir. Jose, I'm, I'm looking at the Inventzilla right now. It's called Hangouts 885. Is that right? It's just one. There's only one hangout room. Is that That's correct. Yeah, there's one hangouts room okay. and plenty of breakout rooms. Okay. Now here, okay. if you want to take that photograph or uh, if you go to talk to Steve or Kent, they know my email address. They know where I live. They know that I want you to talk to me. Uh, you can get that information and uh, please um, watch the videos. Talk to me, talk to Steve, talk to Kent, and let's get our students speaking a lot more. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. I will stop that share and I will, whoa, I gotta make this, sorry, make this just a little bit wider and I will stop the recording after we give these two guys another round of applause, hey? Oh, and, and Jose, and Jose, please, 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 Jose. Okay, <laughs> thank you.